I'm Kathy Vaness, the general manager of The Golden Door, and I'm so proud to introduce Sylvia Bornstein. Am I saying that correctly? Bornstein. Co-founding teacher with Jack Cornfill at Spirit Rock Meditation Center at Woodacre in California, a senior teacher at the Insight Meditation Society. Oh my gosh, I want to hear all about that. A practicing psychotherapist since 1967. She holds a PhD in psychology. This list goes on, by the way. This is just the beginning. She lectures nationally on meditation, mindfulness, and how to make daily life a meditative practice. We're going to love this. Whether driving or standing at a checkout line or sitting on a meditation cu cushion. Her numerous books include Happiness is an Inside Job. Great title. Practicing for a Joyful Life. Pay Attention for Goodness Sakes. <laughs> the Buddha's Path of Kindness. It's easier than you think. The Buddhist way to happiness, just do it. I like that. Something, just sit there and that's, just do it. Just do something, sit there and that's funny. And you don't look Buddhist on being a faithful Jew and a passionate Buddhist, a religion that's quite special. So we're going to start with some really fun questions. And it's really about you tonight a bit. And we're going to learn something that we can all sort of take away. What does enlightenment mean to you? Oh, my. When I started to practice, people asked, when did you get involved with, uh, with Buddhism? In the 1970s, there was suddenly a big interest in meditation in the United States, in the West in general. Uh, you may remember, I'm looking around and I know people's ages more or less than this week. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, it was the Beatles who introduced uh, their teacher, the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, uh, to the whole of the population of the United States and the Western Europe. And people got interested in transcendental meditation. And they got in interested, how many people here did TM and got initiated into TM? A couple of people, there you go. Um, and every other kind of thing. All of a sudden, every weekend, you could go to a workshop to learn something or other. And people talked a lot about enlightenment, whatever that was. And we didn't even know what it was, but it sounded like a good thing to have. Uh, <laughs> you know one of the cartoons I have on my bulletin board? You know those cartoons, they've been in, the, in magazines for decades now. Someone has climbed up a, a mountain, talked to the guru sitting at the mountaintop, and say, what is the meaning of life? There's any number of cartoons. Could be a whole cartoon book curated, probably has been, of people climb up. And there's a, a person sitting in a loincloth in, in the door of a cave at the top of the mountain. And you can see that here's the climber who's puffing and huffing to the top. And you can see that the climber has asked the question, what's the meaning of life? And the guru in the cave is saying, if I knew the meaning of life, do you think I would be sitting up here in my underwear? So, uh, that, uh, but, and I think it was meant to mock the whole idea that we're somehow going to find the meaning. I actually didn't even think that, that that was a very good question, what's the meaning of life? I have a much, my own take on it is not what's the meaning of it. I don't know. I don't know that anybody knows. It's just happening. My own sense is not what's the meaning of life, but how are we going to do it in some way? Well, that sort of jumps off something that you defined mindfulness as paying attention. You know, that's such a simple thought. Expand on that. Are we not paying attention? I, I think we're, we're paying a scattered attention. We're not really paying a close attention. If we were paying, here, this, this is like going from page one to page 200 in the book. If we were, this is what I believe. I remember the end of this afternoon, I ended up teaching my class. I got I carried away on my kind of a soapbox. I think if we really paid attention any place in this room, because you've talked to each other and everybody knows a lot about each other's lives. If I look around in a boarding lounge uh, of, a, of, of, a, of a flight that I'm going to take, I look around, maybe there's 50 people there, and I don't know any of them. But if I could see, like in a, in a bubble over each one's head, what's going on in this person's life, or if they were carrying a sign, I'm going on this flight because my daughter's about to have a baby and I'm going to be there. I'm going on this flight because my father is dying. My sister died and I'm going to the funeral. I have an opportunity to see a play on Broadway and I'm really interested in it. My lifelong friend is in trouble. My son has been indicted for something and is in jail. 
so if everybody is going someplace or coming from someplace because they're either having some wonderful time in their life or they're having some terrible time in their life, just like everybody else. And every once in a while, you could ring a bell and they could change the signs because we're all just doing everything. And if I look at that, I think everybody is just like me. And everybody wants really to be comfortable in themselves and comfortable with their family. They want things to go well. When I think about that, I have such a sweet feeling about that I'm not traveling alone. I'm with everybody. We're, we're, we are none of this, us doing this trip alone. You and I have enhanced each other's life this week. So when I go home tomorrow, I'm a different person because I met all of you, and you're a different person because you talked to each other and met me. It's true. And we're doing that And we're all very tight lives. here at Golden Door. Yeah. It's very a community. And people talk. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know if it's just women because men talk no, as well. But, but, you know, you give people a situation, particularly this situation, where we're so at ease. There's the, one of the things that I, I was saying to Kathy that seems to me a hallmark of being here is that it's the ultimate in feeling not needy. Anything that you need happens that second. And if it, you're not, if it didn't happen, you could say, I wonder if I could, oh yeah, yeah, you could, whatever it is. And the, the, the mind gets so soothed by it. It's, as, it's just like having, just like when someone is massaging you, it feels soothing. It's like massaging the mind. You're fine. And when we discover that we're really held and cared for, our minds settle down, and then the troubles in our lives, because everybody here has got a story. If I were to say, who here has something that if a magic fairy arrived and said, I'll give you one wish, anybody here has one wish that they would, you know, I would wish that it would fix up my, whatever it is in my family, my grandson's uh, despair about not getting the job that he thought he was going to get. I would fix up this or that. Anybody has anything that they would fix if a magic genie came along? Cindy, no? Oh, do I? Yeah, anybody, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A list. Yeah, Natalie, you have a list? <laughs> Everybody's got a list. And we, some of us have very serious things on our list. My child should get over the illness, this one should survive that, that one should survive this. And we get up in the morning and we do our lives anyway. And that really is so remarkable about people. I think if I think about it, I'm a nicer person during that day. I but feel do you find that people own. are, do you think that as a society, there's two questions, one I'm going to lead into. With mindfulness becoming such an important part of not only our life, but also the workplace, mm -hmm. are you finding that mindfulness and the moments for ourselves, that people actually are finding the time? Are you finding that people are just so busy they forget and get sort of I'm hardened so, by it? I'm so you know happy I'm that you asked that. I think because one of the things that I like to have a chance to say is that it doesn't, you don't have to think about, oh, I can't take on another thing. Because, you know, I love the Tai Chi that I did this week, but I, I can't start to go to a Tai Chi class every day. There's no place to put it in, and there's no place to put anything else in that takes up any time and space. The thing with mindfulness is it's not, it doesn't require a time and space. It's an attitude that one brings to one's entire life in the middle of it. If I am, oh, <laughs> here's an example. I, this is what came in my mind the first. It may not be the most apt, but you see. Uh, what if I, uh, uh, I'm at home and my husband of 60 years, in some sort of conversation, says something that really trips up a nerve in my mind. I really don't like it when he says that. Uh, anybody knows that feeling or does that? You know, okay, you got that feeling. And he says it. And, he know, and have we not said a million times, please don't say that, you know, that I don't like it. So I hear that, and a feeling goes off in my mind, ding. He said that again. And there's a, like a momentary arising of dismay in my mind and negativity in my mind. And it's really easy, if I'm not careful, mindful, paying attention, for me to say, you know, I told you 5,000 times. Really, I don't like when you say that. I could say that. Or in that moment of dismay, it could be like a bell, ding dong. And I could think to myself, ah. Uh, I just got annoyed, but you know what? 
He's a really sweet guy, and he put up with me 60 years, and this is a stupid habit that he occasionally does. It's not the whole story, and I'd save us both a lot of trouble if I just take a breath, remember, and I think in my mind, may you be peaceful and happy and not suffer in your life at all, then I feel better, and he feels better, and I, when I do that, I honestly feel like I dodged a bullet. I could have messed up the whole afternoon or the whole evening for myself and for him. I didn't have to, what if I had said, you know, this is the 5,010th time I've told you I don't like that. It's not gonna change it right then after 60 years. It's not gonna change anymore. Be able to say, ding. So that's what, they, that's, that's the practice of mindfulness in daily life. Pay attention and in the moment when I'm about to open my mouth and say something, say, well, you know what? Let's say something else. It's like, if I could draw a picture of mindful behavior, it's you're going through the day and we keep meeting crossroads. I'm wheeling my stuff up to the counter to check out in the supermarket and the person, two people in front of me is taking an extremely long time and they're deciding that they forgot their coffee in the middle and they have to go back and I'm looking at my watch and I see I'm gonna be late for my dentist and I start to feel annoyed with myself and I think, well, I'll get out of this line, but by this time all the other lines are all taken up. There are possibility in that moment that my mind could take a road that says, once again, you chose a stupid, this line and you should have really looked. That would be one maladaptive response. Or I could say, what's the matter with this checker? Why don't they just hurry it up? Or I could say, just my luck, look what's happening all of which create a storm of negativity in my mind. Or I could say to myself, you know what, sweetheart? You just got worried that you're gonna be late. So you'll be a few minutes late. What's gonna happen? Either the dentist will have room for me, which is likely, or he won't. And if he doesn't, it's likely they'll give you another appointment. After 40 years with the same dentist, he's not gonna fire you because you're <laughs> 10 minutes late. I mean, is there a point? Do I accomplish anything? Well, I love that simpleness. I want to add another question to that. In your book, That's Funny, You Don't Look Buddhist, you explain the synergies between Buddhist and Jewish faiths. Mm -hmm. How are we going to take this incredible wisdom that you have and apply it not even to, to ourselves? Wouldn't the world be a lot more mindful? And wouldn't we be able to maybe control some of the things that are said amongst the world and be a better place? Are the principles of Judaism and Buddhism how will we teach that to the new generations that are coming up so they can maybe fight less? You know, I think what's happening, this is really, that's a, that's a really, I have to, that's a really novel question, so let me put it this way. I think that every great religion that has ever endured is based on the realization that when we thoughtfully are mindful of other people's rights and other people's stories, when we stop to consider everybody suffers and really, the truth that we feel better when we don't hurt people, mm -hmm. that the do unto others as you would like others to do law. unto you is really mm -hmm. based on our own nervous system. Love one another as I have loved you is what Jesus said. That, that it's, it's not an idle instruction. It's an, it's an observation about why human beings So why is the world better. becoming more violent? Uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm hopeful that this is the thing that gives me a lot of hope that now this is the first time in history when we can know instantaneously what's going on all over the world. That didn't happen before. And on the one hand, you can say, whoa, I am overwhelmed by the media. So much input. Right. On the other hand, when I look at things like, uh, well, I, this was the first time I had this image, was when in the time, a couple of years ago now, when we had the time of the Arab Spring, and it didn't work out as well as we all hoped it would work out. But for a while, there was that image in my mind of so many people in, in the main square in Cairo and uh, peacefully requesting a change in the government. And it was for a long time peaceful. It didn't work out in the end as well, but all of these people maintaining the peace to make the point about what they want. And all of them were on cell phones. And I thought they're all texting each other to tell them. And I thought, now the world is wired. Everybody can write to anybody. I think to myself, if Mark Zuckerberg wrote to everybody in the world and said, listen, we're killing the planet, we're killing ourselves, let's just stop. 
and talk to each other. Everybody's a person. Everybody deserves a life. Let's figure it out. It could happen. I think so too. It could happen. It and could I happen. really take a lot. And I think that people respond to that. I think so too. Let's be kind to each other. It's a really good. And everybody said that, not just the Buddha. Every, the, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, everybody. It's the essence of Christianity. Right. It's right. the essence of Judaism. Right. It's right. the essence of Islam, really, right. which means peace. Right. So there you go. Yeah, have we just have to go back to that listening part. We have to really watch. I think it's so hard. This is really what's, what's, what's an important thing to notice, that even though when we feel at ease and peaceful, as we do here, because we're so well taken care of, we don't get annoyed, you know. You probably, I asked this afternoon in class how many people so far today got annoyed at anything. Usually we get annoyed at one or, a, one or another thing, whatever. But people saying, you know, not too annoyed, pretty. So when we're really relaxed, we, we have a good, our good nature shows out. It's tremendously simple to become annoyed. When we're clear-minded, we take care of each other. We don't get angry. We educate people, like with our children. We teach them what to do. We don't be mad at them. You know what? I, ha I, this is, I, I hadn't thought I was going to tell you this. Um, three years ago, I was in Europe with my husband, and he took terribly ill all of a sudden. He's, a ma he's 84 now, so he survived. And he's in excellent health, and he's a competitive athlete, and he's fine. But he took terribly ill, and he was in the hospital, and it was extremely for he was on life support for 10 days, so I didn't know if he'd live or not. So I sat there for 10 days, waiting to see how it was going to go. He had marvelous health care. And during that time, I thought to myself, I realized how dear he was to me. I really have known him since I'm 16 years old. And I realized how dear he was to me, and I thought, if he survives this and gets better, all those ridiculous little things that he does, those quirks, his personality, this, that, or the other, that used to annoy me, they won't annoy me anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get annoyed, but those are really stupid. The main thing is that he's a wonderful person. We've made a whole life together. We've raised all these children together. Annoyance will not arise in me again because I see what's really important. So then he didn't die, and then we came home. And he did the stupid thing, and annoyance <laughs> arises. It just does. We have, we have. Did you calm yourself and say, "Go away"? <laughs> well, you know, I'm better now than then. That's when I realized I got better at that thing of saying he just said that stupid thing. But I have a choice now. I can run with it and and mess up the afternoon, or I can take a deep breath and say, you know, that's his foolish habit. He just learned that from his parents and their parents and whatever. So in, I think we change. In your book, Pay Attention for Goodness Sake, you focus on 10 paramitas. Paramitas. Can you explain, and why did you choose a whole book for the 10? It sounds quite profound. I looked through it. Can first you explain the 10 to our I audience? I can. I can. This is a piece of Buddhist mythology. So we've just said that what the Buddha taught is a universal truth. Uh, the truth that things are, I'm going to tell you the universal truth first. This is the big revelation of the Buddha. He says it in four sentences. He says, life is challenging for everybody because our circumstances keep changing and we need to keep adapting. That's the first one. The second one is when we have an imperative in the mind that things be different from how they are right now, then we suffer. They can't be different from how they are right now. They can change in the future, but to storm about something that can't be creates creates tension in the mind, and that imperative in the mind is painful. And the third truth is that human beings have the possibility of accommodating what's happening. They have the possibility of being peaceful no matter what. No matter what. We uh, have a friend uh, who uh, developed MS in her 40s when she was, her career was just flourishing, everything was wonderful, and suddenly she got a diagnosis of MS. So they have different uh, ways that they evolve, but it's, it's not a reversible thing. You have it, and then you deal with it. And she said about it, she said, this isn't what I wanted, but it's what I got. And I, to be able to make that with anything, with anything, your child makes an X decision and you wanted them to make Y. It isn't what I wanted, but it's what I got. 
your partner falls out of love with you and in love with somebody else. This isn't what I wanted. That's so what what, tell us a little bit more about those 10 things. So I'm coming to the 10 things. Uh, so, and so that's, that, that's actually the wisdom of the Buddha, that human beings could do that and that we could cultivate the kinds of minds that do that, period. That's the wisdom of the Buddha and all great religious faiths <coughs> say that, except most of us didn't learn it as part of our growing up in religious faiths where we mostly learn the rituals of the faith and not the deep meaning of it. So that's that. It's said in Buddhism, this is part of the folklore of the Buddha, which people believe or don't believe, every religion has a folklore, that the Buddha lived many lifetimes before he was Siddhartha Gautama, who had that realization and who taught it for 40 years. And they said the requirement for him to be established enough in his own clarity of mind so that this was the lifetime in which he had his final realization and was free from getting entangled in fruitless struggle was that in previous lifetimes he had perfected 10 particular traits of virtue. And the particular traits of virtue, you think about them, they're all permutations of each other. <laughs> Don't worry about it, Gene. It happens to everybody. <laughs> it happens to everybody. It often happens in the middle of I'm leading a meditation and a whole room of people are, are quiet and all of a sudden someone's self. The, the, the most funny was a whole tremendous room full of people are sitting quietly meditating and somebody's cell phone goes off and it goes and its tune that it goes off to is the sound of a rooster crowing, cock a doodle doo, cock a doodle doo. That person really felt terrible. It's nothing. The ten the ten traits are in a way all like each other. What the first is generosity, and the second is morality, and the third is renunciation, and wisdom, and energy, and determination, and uh, I left out one. Uh, loving kindness and compassion and determination and one other, patience, patience. And they're all like each other because when you say here, they're really all permutations of each other. They're all gifts. I, think I, I, I ended up with patience. So this is the gift. If you, have, if you have patience, you also have wisdom because suppose I go into the dry cleaners and I say, here's my ticket, um, you know, um, my sweater. And they go back and they look. And they say, you know, it's not here. And I say, but it says on the ticket that it's going to be here today. They say, it's not here. And you can see that the dry cleaner person is getting a little tense. And the people around you are also waiting to see what's going to happen, a little tense. And you, because you're being mindful and thoughtful and wise, take a breath in and out, and you realize that anything other than, okay, I'll come back tomorrow, would be upsetting to everybody, and it would not materialize the sweater. The biggest thing, the sweater's not going to be there. It's not here, it's not here. So you think, what's the wisest thing for everybody here? And the wisest thing is to say, okay, I'll be back tomorrow. This isn't what I wanted, but it's what I got. That's true. And how many times in life do we... So easy to need do, to do that. Really. I have a friend who's a driving instructor for you know, for people who uh, have to <laughs> be in those classes <laughs> oh, <laughs> because they got school. too many citations. Oh no! Oh no! That takes patience. <laughs> and, he, and he said, you know, he said, I'm teaching people. I'm and, and sometimes he does the driving classes where he uh, dri teaches people who drivers in cars. And Marin County, where we live, is really a, a lovely place to, we have nice highways and they frequently get clogged up they just get all crowded and he said I teach people when we get in a, on a highway and we're in a traffic jam and I see they're tensing up I say to them listen relax look around you this this particular scenery people come from far and wide to have a vacation here to look at Mount Tamalpais right over there look at Muir Woods on the side of the mountain Look over there, you can see the San Francisco Bay. People come from far and wide to see this view. So we'll get, you'll get where you get when you get there. That's all, that's the same as the sweater will be exactly, in the dry cleaner exactly. when it's finished. 
patience, they're all permutations of wisdom. Patience is the only wise response when it's not happening. You're such a special guest for us this week. Can you tell us your story of how you discovered this path, this meditative sort of mindful path that you have today for us? I can. Um. <laughs> I was late coming to meditation uh, uh, in the sense of I didn't grow up with it. I, I grew up in an ordinary household, in, uh, an ordinary Jewish household in South Brooklyn. And uh, uh, I married my husband, and one thing or another, he trained as a psychiatrist. We moved to the Midwest, and then we moved to California, and we had four children. And I trained as a social worker, and I worked teaching. Uh, I worked in a clinic, and I was teaching um, child development and uh, abnormal psychology in a junior college, having a regular life. I was, uh, as a young adult, in my 30s, quite active uh, in my 20s and 30s uh, in political causes when I could be. I, I, I wheeled my children down Market Street in San Francisco uh, in, uh, in protest the war parades in the 1970s. When were they born? 62, 61, 62. And I remember that feeling. Uh, they remember it also. Uh, and so I would have said about my own spiritual life that uh, my, my, my spiritual commitment was to really be concerned for the world, and it, it expressed itself in that kind of political activism. My family before me had, uh, at being all immigrants to this new country because they wanted to live in a democracy, treated voting like it was a religious ritual. And we all went to the polls together. Mm -hmm. And I went with my, I, went, I walked with them. It was like a religious procession. My grandparents walked, my parents. We walked to the polls. I stood in a voting booth and watched my mother vote. So I very early learned to be politically excited about the possibility of choosing a government. And in the 70s, when it started, that people were all becoming interested in this guru and that guru and the other guru, I wasn't so interested in that. I was working as a therapist, and I had my now four teenage children growing up. and. Uh, but my husband was really interested in that. He liked all that stuff. He liked all the, what's the meaning of life. He would have these debates. He'd say, I really want to understand life. And I would say, not me. I just want to stand life, mm -hmm. you know? Because I, I looked around, I think so many terrible things happened to people. And I wanted so much for them not to happen to me or my children. And he'd go off to this guru or that guru or this group or that group, and he'd get initiated into it. And he'd come home and he'd say, so you have to try this. So I would try it. I would go, I would get initiated, I would come home, I would try that meditation for two or three days, I would be bored, I wouldn't do it anymore. And he did one thing, another thing, another thing, another thing. A couple of years went by and then he went off and did a mindfulness retreat for two weeks, which was a big thing. He went for two weeks, silent retreat, and he came home and he said, so you have to do this, this is really great. And uh, it's kind of funny because he said uh, I, I, there was a weekend retreat that I could have gone to. Took me to a weekend retreat to try it out. He drove me to a place in San Jose. And it was a private retreat, maybe 20 people there in a, in a private house where we all uh, sat, sat in, uh, in the garage, I think they had places where we could sit and meditate. And we all slept on the floor on mattresses in two bedrooms, getting dressed and undressed with all these strange people, one mattress on either side. And I was old, I was 40 years old, and these were all 23-year-olds, 22-year-olds, just graduated from college, just back from India, much more hip than I. They didn't mind getting dressed and undressed all together with other people. I didn't like it, but anyway, I did it. But more than anything, I didn't know they weren't gonna have coffee there. I had a terrible headache, terrible. And I, the whole weekend, I'm thinking, if he come, when he comes to get me, I couldn't leave. I didn't have a car, and a cell phone, I'm abandoned there. So when he comes, I'm going to tell him about what I thought about this meditation. 
And then he came and picked me up. And somehow, a month, two months later, I was myself on a plane for a two-week meditation retreat. And people say, well, well, how did that happen? You had such a bad time there. I, I had a bad time there. I had a terrible headache and everything else. But I actually listened to my teacher's talk and talk about exactly the same thing that I just said before about life is inevitably challenging. And there are all kinds of times when our mind gets caught in a trap of so anguishing over what's happening. And to be able to say, this isn't what I wanted, but it's what I got. Wow. It's something I wanted so much. Well, you know, that takes me to an interesting place. The Dalai Lama is the most revered leader of Buddhism, I would have to say, ever. Mm -hmm. Certainly, we all know him. We all know his sayings. We know his books. We might not even remember the name of the, 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 the pre-Dalai Lamas, you know, not many of the three heads and leaders. Mm -hmm. What happens next to the Buddhist religion, now he lives in India, he sort of, you know, has to live in India, well, they have to replace, they're not gonna be able to go replace him in Tibet. Mm. Yeah. So how, that just seems, talk about your political side of you, which I think would be so interesting to ask you this question. What happens to the Dalai Lama who can't go back to his homeland to find the new Buddha? You know what, the new on, leader. on that, I, I don't think it's gonna happen in Tibet. He's so but famous, it has to be somebody really, like, right? Yeah, but I don't think it'll flourish in Tibet. No. I, I think, because Tibet is now, Right, is now, so it has to be in now. India, right? It'll have to be somewhere else, but you know, when someone asked him at some point, not so long ago, what would you do when you're really old? Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, he said, I don't know, he said, maybe I'll find some, uh, monastery in China. There are some lovely monasteries in China. And I thought, what a, what a really expansive thing to say. Here it's the Chinese themselves who have taken over and colonized yeah. Tibet. But for him to be able to say... He's so, he, he was a boy when he started, and the concept of us knowing him his whole life as he grew up and starting back as a boy, where will they go to search for this new boy? Yeah, it's or... It's quite an interesting... What will happen? You know, he's been, he actually has been having a slightly different message in the last few years. Um, I've been listening to, uh, I've been listening to the message on and off for now 20 some years. And in recent years, he's been saying more of, it doesn't matter to me, he says to a big audience, mm -hmm. says it doesn't matter to me if you're a Buddhist, says what it really matters to me is that you're an ethical person. Mm. And what he is really stressing, I'm glad we came around to this, Kathy, because what he's really stressing is what I see as the change in uh, the spiritual awareness of the whole United States, as far as I see it, that when we started in the 60s and 70s, people were really hoping to become enlightened, even they didn't know what that was, but they wanted to have it. And now what they're looking for is more of a way to restore peace in their own hearts so that we can live more effectively and peacefully with each other and maybe with the whole world. And that's the message that he'd like to share. And so rather than teach it as Buddhism, he's teaching it as really ethical awareness and that these particular paramitas, these qualities of the heart, are what we need. They amount to enlightenment. Yeah. If enlightenment is understanding that there's a very small planet on its last gasp, you know. And, and he has a powerful voice. He's a powerful voice. Right? I mean, I've listened to him many times, and every time I think, I go, my, who is the new voice that's going to be behind it? I don't think it's as easy with technology as today as it was then, when you were a boy, and maybe no one really talked about it that much. I think it's going to be quite different in the next generation to think about how that's actually mm -hmm. going to transpire. And I think that some of the things, like, for you know? instance, I think about some of the moments that I have had when I've been in a room with him and watched him, they so, um, they so indelibly inscribed themselves. I, I was at a teaching where he taught a particular, um, a particular practice out of an old book on cultivating uh, alternatives to anger. Uh, and how it's, ca it's called the chapter on patience, and it's what to do when anger arises. It's clearly taking this fork in the road but if over a course of a whole week, for several hours every day, he did verse by verse by verse, and he would read it in Tibetan, 
And uh, then he would translate it, and his translator always sits right by his side. Uh, but his English is quite good. And he'd translate, and, and then he would do an exegesis of the text. He'd talk about what it meant and what he thought. And there are maybe 60 verses about if this happens and anger arises, you should reflect this way. And if this happens and anger arises, you should think about this. And if this happens and anger comes up, you should think about that. All ways to avoid the mind being filled with anger, which confuses it and inflames it. And then on the, on the Friday of the week, when he came to the last paragraph and in the last verse, and he read the verse, and then suddenly he leaned forward like that, and it was, when it fell over, it looked like, with his head in his hands, he has 2,000 people sitting in the auditorium, the kind of a collective gasp, maybe his holiness. Looked to me, of course, this is my worrisome mind, looked to me like, oh dear, he had a stroke, he fell over, you know. And he sat like that for a little bit, and then he picked himself up a little bit and take out his handkerchief, and you could see he was crying, and that, he had read this really monumental text over a week about do this, do that, do this, do that. Anything in place of letting yourself be carried away by anger. And that, that so seemed to me so fundamental to his belief that we really could live as human beings in a way that was peaceful and that it was possible and that he had made that point over and over and over again. And it wasn't as if I realized I was so moved because it wasn't as if that was the first time he'd read that text in his life. He probably taught it any number of times, but that he was so overwhelmed by it that he wept. And that, I can't even remember all the things he said, but that moment I remember. Some months ago, do you, I don't know if you know Don Farber. Mm -hmm. Don Farber is one of the photographers for the Dalai Lama, and he travels with him. And he was here speaking in one of our interview nights and brought some of his work. And it's interesting, the question, um, it's gonna be a question for you. His work was trying to capture the insides of this world of Buddhism and tradition that is di that may be actually dying off on the sense of the truly traditional side. Mm -hmm. Because as it becomes more westernized, it takes a slight different mm -hmm. effect. Mm -hmm. Do you see that happening? I think the Western, the, well the Western world has uh, uh, really, say in the United States, there's a, a tremendous a breadth of Buddhist community. First of all, there are all the Asian communities mm -hmm. that, uh, that came from the whole of Southeast Asia and other places, and Korea and Japan and China as well, and who came uh, with the culture and the, the um, rituals right. that they grew up in. Yeah. Uh, so They're they very deep. And they continue as a faith religion, and for the most part, uh, it's not, um, it's, they're not contemplatives. So that, it's just like in Western religion, uh, returning contemplation to, to Christianity mm -hmm. and to Judaism where it once was and isn't now. Is it now? It's what's happening. Right, don't we, we need that to come back? I think so, because I think on some level, you can think about, it's a nice idea to love your neighbor as your friend, but really I think what really transforms you is, f is discovering that when I love my neighbor as my friend, when I even love my formerly, I couldn't stand that person, I don't even have to like them. Right. That's the amazing thing about when you say love your neighbor, doesn't mean you have to like the neighbor. <laughs> doesn't mean you have to like the neighbor, it just means that your heart has no animosity towards them. Imagine that we could empty our hearts of animosity without losing our discerning wisdom. I can remember who I want to vote for in the fall without hoping that, he, that it'll befall them. Right. I, I agree with you. We should be much kinder. <laughs> I, I think, think it's something we're missing. Everybody is saying that. I know. I think, and I think that the people are speaking it out and saying we need to be kinder. I think we're a nation that was invented on escaping right. bad things. That's how we became. And the Dalai Lama says when people say, what's your religion? He's very famous for saying, my religion is kindness. And that's a great, I love that. That's, if I had one, if you, that's my golden nugget. I don't know, we might have to go back to that. What's a good way for us to start inclining our minds to more quietness and kindness and away from fear? You just led me right to where I just needed to go. You're so <laughs> cute. And aversion, just like it's like we didn't practice this, I promise. <laughs> so, you know, we want to have something sort of tangible that what could we, what could we do? Because we can pass this on, of course, to our yeah. own children. Yeah. 
I think we do, just in the way that we live, because our children see how we handle different kinds of things, how we talk, uh, the, the, our demeanor. Somebody that I talked to today, uh, I don't even remember who it was, but, uh, oh, actually, actually she's not here, so it's not nice to about. Actually, it was Teresa. Oh, it's Chris, yes, it's lovely Teresa. Teresa, yes. it was. <laughs> we know Teresa. It was Teresa, and I was saying, I think it was Teresa, who knows, it was somebody, maybe it was somebody here, who said that when my husband and I sit down for dinner with our two children, it wasn't Teresa, it was somebody else, uh, we, before we eat, we say what we're grateful for that day. I love that. So I think that's the beginning of a practice of having a non-aversive uh, uh, relationship with life. I think that that's what I want to do. I want really my, for my, I know that when I am in love with being alive and I'm happy about it, I'm a kind person. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really interested in helping the world and doing good things. And when I'm frightened, then I forget about the world. They could, they could just disappear. And my mind really uh, implodes into my own self. How will I do that? How will I manage that? What if this? What if that? And I think that just by cultivating in all the ways that we do, uh, the idea that there's an easeful, peaceful way to live together, people are going to learn that. We have a, a blackboard on property that says, I am grateful for, and it's like repeated line after line after line in these like rows with like dot, 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 like I am grateful for, everybody's different, everybody would say something different, so we put it out for our guest one week. We gave it to our employees another week. And it was amazing what was written on this board. It was, I have goosebumps when I went back to read it and you know, they would write on the sides because they didn't have enough space. And it was just incredible what people wanted to express in a community of what they had to be grateful for or wanted to be grateful for. Do you know what? It's pretty profound when you actually stop and write it in a community. So because everybody can see. Because when you're grateful and you have gratitude, a, a, a different kind of feeling sets itself up in your mind. They've done research on, uh, on this, where a group of people are about to have a meditation session, and they have a control group, and they do it over and over again. And the experimental group is asked, before you start to meditate, close your eyes and think of something kind that you did today. So you can find something. I held the door for somebody going into the bank, or I helped somebody step over the curb, or something, think of something. Or, and after that, think of something kind that somebody did to you or for you. Somebody held the door, somebody held my arm, somebody said thank you, somebody this or that. Then they say, okay, ready, set, go, now we're going to meditate. And I don't know exactly how they do the, thing, the, 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 the exact uh, instructions for the meditation. But the group that thought about kindness first, for just a few minutes, found their meditation to be way more profound than the other people, because basking in the awareness of kindness, whether you did it or somebody else did it, calms down your mind, and it makes everything easier. But we don't teach kindness anymore. Where are we going to teach it? It's not something that's taught. Well, I think that's it's I mean, a miss. All of us. I, mean, would I think that's one of the things you talk a lot about is the that kindness. That civil discourse right. is one of those things. Right. What happened to civics? <laughs> I mean, there was a bit there. I don't know if they have that class anymore. <laughs> I think that's been eliminated in the budget cuts, maybe. No, but I, I, I actually, I don't know that the world is less kind because it's always had tragedies and, and difficulties. But I'm again, I'm, I'm hopeful that icons like celebrities or presidents or... Uh, but that's not so kind. Well, I hope we have presidents... And the, the Kardashians, I don't know, that's not so kind. Our cult icons today are getting less kind. I th I'm hopeful that we'll have some that some demonstrate kindness, kindness and, and, really and civil discourse, you know? The idea of being able to say, you know, I really disagree with your view, but well, okay. uh, let's discuss it. Exactly. You know, I have this view, you have that view, it let's matter, discuss right. it. Let's discuss it. You know, this, well, is, this is especially a year when we all have to be able to uh, think about it. You know, I don't want to use up all your time because you may have questions. I went to uh, a dinner of donors for the San Francisco Zen Center uh, uh, the night after the first time that Mr. Obama was elected president. 
and it ha and I did vote for him, uh, and I was pretty excited that it, I thought it was, an if nothing else, it was an historic moment in the history of the United States. It turned out that most of the people sitting at this table had also voted that way. But we w didn't talk about politics. We were there supporting Zen Center and uh, the wonderful work it does with its hospice in San Francisco. And everybody was animatedly talking about that and also talking about trips and travel abroad and where people had gone. And that was all very interesting and everybody was involved in the conversation. And then it got around to the election the day before. Turned out that uh, pretty near everybody at that table had voted for Mr. Obama. And it was a very exciting conversation because everybody was very flush with that. And uh, a little bit into the conversation, a man sitting exactly across from me who had been quite involved in all the previous conversations said in a quiet voice, you know, uh, you'll all be surprised to know, to, to know that I voted exactly differently from all of you. And there was like a moment of silence all of a sudden. And like you could hear everybody's gears mm -hmm. shifting around saying, he has this perfectly nice man who we were really enjoying so much, who said such interesting things about his trip to the Amazon, et cetera, et cetera, and has also supported Zen Center. <laughs> so you see the gears, because they have to let in. Yes. And he voted different from yeah. me. And as a collective body, they just picked it up and let it Good. float away. And we, it's like he did, a, he did a course correction for everybody by saying that. I was very proud of him, yeah. rather than just sit there. And all of these people that caught themselves and clearly made that inner adjustment, nice people have different political points of view, period. It's perfectly and fine. <laughs> a good debate I, is I very good. Was, I, I, and they also knew about each other that they all have their heart in the right place. Right. Everybody's supporting That's the right. Zen Center. That's right. It's not so like. You know, you've written The Secret to Happiness Lies in Actively Cultivating our capacity to connect with kindness, a couple of things we've talked about, with ourselves and friends and families and those we may not even know. What can we do, because happiness is this great word that's on so many books today, what can we do in understanding happiness as an inside job, whether inside ourselves or around us, to solve this sort of confusion in today's world? Well, maybe that last story is something like it, you know. Uh, that you get caught up, oh. Uh, <laughs> I knew you'd get to come up with a great story. I love your stories. <laughs> oh, well, let me just think which story I want to tell you about <laughs> that. Uh, uh, no, the, it, it, it's a variation on that other story about we get carried away and then we pick it up. I, I, I'll tell you the other side of that story where, where this particular man had said, uh, you know, I voted just opposite. On the, uh, on the day following the election, I went to my needlepoint store. I do very big needlepoints. Uh, they're, not, they're not so creative because they're all stamped there, but it takes a decade to finish them. And I love them. And I have, I have to quit now because I have no more walls. I, uh, anyway. I went to my needlepoint store to pick up one that had been prepared for hanging on a wall. And I'd known this woman for a long time and I'd bought lots of material and yarn there. And uh, I got my stuff and I paid for it and we visited. And I was just about to leave the shop and uh, she said, well, come back, you know, you should get some new material and start another one. I just did this giant one. And I said, you know, I feel in the mood. I could start something new because I'm in a really great mood because I, I was so excited about the election yesterday. And she said, you were? She said, uh, I was so upset I nearly killed myself. And I said, well, why would you want to do that? And then she said, well, do you know about Mr. Obama? And then she said some terrible things about Mr. Obama. And I said, well, really, you want to know some terrible things about Mr. McCain? And I said that right back. And then she said some terrible things, and then I said some terrible things. And, <laughs> and then I left, and I went out the door, and I got in my car, and I felt terrible. Because I thought the operative words that she said was, I was so upset I wanted to kill myself. And the only uh, acceptable answer for me in that circumstance was to say, I'm so sorry 
that you feel that way. I really think it's going to be okay. I really think it's going to be all right. So if I can reassure you, I think it's going to be okay. She went on, I'm thinking of leaving the country. I don't think you have to leave the country. That was the only reasonable answer, and I didn't give it. And I felt miserable, and then I was so embarrassed I couldn't go right back in, and I drove what home. What a great lesson for us. That's a great lesson. I went home, and I felt miserable. And so I went immediately to the telephone, and I phoned the shop, and she didn't answer. And then I made up a story right away. The, oh, see, I upset her so much, she closed the shop and went home. <laughs> and, uh, but I had, I had made a long speech into the phone about, I can't believe I was so insensitive, and I'm terribly sorry, and please forgive me. And in fact, uh, you know, uh, my cousin in San Francisco b votes exactly the way you do, and I would always want to have a discussion with her about her point of view and mine so we could understand each other better, because I really love her. It's a long message to live on an answering machine of my needlepoint lady. You know, so. <laughs> but I leave the whole message on the machine, and then I hang up. And then 10 minutes later, she calls me back. <gasps> And she says, you know, I'm sorry I couldn't answer the phone. I was with a customer at the time, but now I'm back. Listen, thank you so much. I really feel bad about how you left, and I didn't handle that right, and I said some not nice things. And really, you know, sometimes, unlike your cousin in San Francisco who doesn't want to talk to you about politics, if you want to come, we could talk to each other about it. It was just such a nice way. So it makes two points, at least. I hadn't even thought about that. One is that we lose it. You could be a mindfulness teacher for a million years, and, some, and you're tired, you stayed up all night to watch the results, and you're a little bit wacky, and you lose it, and you say the wrong thing. And she also loses it and says the wrong thing. But you can pick it up. You can say, I'm sorry, made a mistake, let's start again. And you know, that's, I think, what we do for each other. We teach each other how to do that. Do you still go on retreats? Yeah. Do you think it's something we should do more of? I mean, again, it's, it's hard enough for people to carve out seven days to come to the Golden Door. How do we carve out that time to really go? Well, and I think this is like a retreat, right? It is like a retreat. We're, we're pretty retreatish. I mean, we're, we're pretty humble and pretty, pretty protected here. And my but guess people have seemed to, you'd be surprised how many say, I can't find seven days for myself. Yeah, that, that, Out of 365, and, by you know, the way. But I also think that people come here and they don't think that they're on a meditation retreat. But in fact, I think if we talked to all of us, uh, if we had private conversations or more time or for you to talk with each other, that when the mind feels so relaxed as it does here, what, what happens to me is that often some naughty situation in my own life that's been... Um, that seemed like an insoluble kind of a problem. That if I'm in a situation where my mind and my body are really completely relaxed, all of a sudden, like, da-da, this is what I should do. It's like an intuition arises out of nowhere. And it's not out of nowhere, it's out of your own creativity. But you, your mind has to be relaxed mm -hmm. in order to do that. And I think it happens here. I think it happens also. So you'll come back. Oh, if you have me, yes. <laughs> So at the end of all of our chats, my lovely chats, and I just love this every week that I get to talk to so many incredible people, we always reach out to our guest and ask them to leave our guests a golden nugget. And you've left us a couple of golden nuggets, so we're going to have a big winner tonight. We're going to get a few golden nuggets. But if you could leave us one incredible golden nugget, what would be the golden nugget that you would leave us tonight? My, uh, my friend Amaro, who teaches um, at, uh, is actually the abbot of a monastery in, uh, outside of London, teaches this as his meditation instruction. So I'll tell you this instruction. He teaches, um, he says, let your mind and body assume the natural peace and ease that is the natural peace and ease of your mind and body and let it stay that way. That's the whole yeah, instruction. And when you hear it, I think, and it goes in, it reminds your mind that your actual birthright is peace and ease. When we're not all flared up by what's going on and all the stories we tell ourselves about what's going on, there's peace and ease in there. And so sometimes when I'm sitting, and 
I'm hopeful that this is going to be a contemplative time, I might say to myself, may my mind and body assume the natural peace and ease that is its birthright, and I just sit there. Sometimes when I'm in the middle of a difficult situation, my plane is bouncing around, or there are too many people online ahead of me, or uh, suddenly something isn't working right, and I'm beginning to feel da-da-da about it, I think to myself, peace and ease. I just think it. And I remember that peace and ease is that the, it's the natural option that hasn't gone away. It's still in there, and it's got flurry in front of it because something and something and something is happening. But behind the flurry is the peace and ease. And if I can remind myself that it's there, whether it's in the middle of a, of a meeting with a, with a staff meeting at Spirit Rock or a teacher meeting or a conference or this or that and stuff is going on, and I say to myself, peace and ease, Sylvia. Oh, I love that. You know that? So there you go.